So just to start, um, just provide a little bit about your journalistic background. Well, I uh, started at Little Community College in Corpus Christi doing journalism, starting student publications and covering uh, politics and government, worked my way up to Texas State student publications, and then started getting professional internships at a uh, you know, little community newspaper first, and then Collar Times, Corpus, and then uh, I worked at the state legislature covering uh, the Austin legislature before I left school, and then I had a job waiting for me at the Beaumont Enterprise, and then I went to the Examiner, and I worked at papers all over the state of Texas since 2012, and then recently in Colorado, worked for a year, paper up in the Northwest, and now I'm back in Texas, working as the managing editor, and I'm now in charge of a small staff, reporters, photographers, and designers, and spread in Texas. Now, prior to Marvin's case, uh, did you have any experience investigating any other like no-knock warrant cases with either? No. Okay, cool. Um, had you ever heard of no-knock raids or no-knock warrants prior to that? I think I had. Yes, I had heard of that. Uh, so I had heard there was one in, in our area, and was, you know, we covered it pretty, and it was obviously you know, just a huge high-profile case. Right. Now, I don't know how it works in the news business because I've never worked in it, but so this may be kind of self explanatory, but um, I'm going to ask it anyways. How soon after uh, the raid took place on like Marvin's apartment did you find out about it? Was it immediate? Was there a delay in time? H how did that work out? So, uh, did we, you know, hospitalization and post death, did you maybe heard about it, you know, pretty soon? quickly and the paper was all over I think that I don't know exactly when the community got word of it you know but uh, because I was actually the second reporter believe it or not to kind of take over that that case I was not there when I was Okay. Um, and what were your initial thoughts uh, based on what you heard? Well, based on my initial thoughts, you know, I, I thought Castle Doctrine, and I thought, you know, Second Amendment, the, you know, the Second Amendment community should be up in arms or about all of this, right? You know, what I didn't know was how the legal framework of Texas affected all that, you know, and, you know, because he's a convicted felon. You know, just the race thing aside, you know, if it's a you know, is that allowed? I don't, I don't really know, you know. From mm -hmm. a, but at, on its face value, it really seemed kind of, you know, like, did they, if they were doing a no-knock and they didn't announce themselves, how is the, how is, you know, that anything other than a justified shooting if there if was a man trying to protect him, protect his life and property in Texas? Right. Um. How soon after you heard about the story did you begin to investigate it? Like, soon, you know, yeah. yeah I think that's... As soon as I, I mean, as soon as I had the ability to start writing about it, okay. I wanted to get in there and start writing about it, and I did it. Okay. Now, how long after you began to investigate Marvin's case or do research about it did you actually meet Marvin? Probably pretty quick. Uh, I basically wrote Marvin. Uh, I, got, I figured out I needed to get on his approved visitors list. And so I wrote him a letter and asked, you know, hey, man, I'm a reporter. Started working as a, as a crime, on the crime beat. I'd really like to talk to you about what happened. If you'd be willing to be, be, be a video conference, that'd be really cool. I have to be in that to have on your approved visitors list. And sure enough, he approved me, and we started meeting, like, Sometimes it was every week. Sometimes it was like two or three times a week. Wow. I'd just like pop in. I was I was there at the jail every day, you know, uh, covering the, the crime, the felony beat. Like the, the Colleen area is like a really good area to be a crime reporter, okay? There's always some kind of felonies running its way through the courts. This was the biggest 
the biggest case, you know, say by far that me as a crime reporter, I'm in charge of covering. You know, like, you know, it's a capital murder case of a, of a fucking cop. Excuse my French. Right. You know, like, right. And so, and so, like, you have to think, like, as a beat, as a crime beat reporter, like, this is your most important case. Like, you, and you protect that case too. Like, you, like, take something you take very, very seriously, you know, like investigating this and doing it right and that kind of thing. So it's like, you know, that kind of thing is, that's the, that's the biggest, most important case on your, on your stock, you know? Right. Now, what were your impressions of Marvin initially when you met him? And did your opinion of him or impressions change over time? Uh, my initial impressions of him was that uh, he was a, a friendly guy that was uh, really upset and scared and like just like done with the system. You know what I mean? Didn't oh, trust oh. anybody. Felt totally screwed by everybody that he, that he met. Didn't trust anybody. Was you know was having to take medication take a lot of medication because he's in there like depressed you know he hasn't got a trial he's locked up he hasn't been convicted enough of anything yet you know and so just a guy in there trying to you know guy in there who like I think needed a friend because he didn't have anybody in the corner at least he, he certainly didn't feel that like he did <laughs> right Right. I think I, I think he, he, a guy. My first impression of him was he was a guy that needs somebody in his corner. Right. Uh, now, what did your conversations entail? What did you guys talk about during your your conversations? So, I tried to make a request, you know, of the city and, and other and you know other agencies, so that I had you know, things to ask him when I went in there. And I, so I started asking him a lot about the evidence, you know, like, hey, what is the deal with all it was this that they found? And what is the deal with that that they found? You know, uh, just trying to get him to explain what he remembers about that night, you know? Right. And, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, yeah, we're, I'm on the road right now. I'll wash it in the back seat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, it's been a moving, yeah, but I moved back to Texas here in the last few weeks, and it's been a wild ride in the last few weeks. Right. Uh, so bear with me. No, but, not a problem. No, I appreciate uh, your time. Basically, I think Marvin, Marvin was talking to me, you know, and he was opening up. He was starting to open up about what he remembers, and, you know, I eventually convinced him, you know, you know, we would talk a, a little bit about the case and then I would try and be like, well, what else is going on? And, you know, what's going on in here? You know, what, what do you need in here? So something I can get you like some freaking compound, like you want some chips or something, commissary, like what can I, you know, like, you know, just like as a friend, trying to try and cheer him up. Cause you could tell the guy was in a rough situation. Like mentally he was not in a good place. Like he was depressed. You could tell, you could tell. And, you know, like, he felt like, he felt sorry for what he did, and he would say that a lot, you know.